الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وصحابه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين All praises due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day. The topic, why fast, is one which addresses the essence of fasting. What is behind fasting? Of course, the simple answer, if a Muslim is asked, why do you fast? They would say, because Allah, God, commanded me to do so. So that's the simple answer. God has commanded it, so we do it. But when people are asking, why do you fast? Why fast? Why put yourself through all those changes? Starving yourself, going thirsty, prohibiting from yourself things which are in fact good things. Why go through all of that? Why would God have us do that? Is it necessary? Is it something necessary for God to worship us? That we have to suffer? This is the big question. If God is a benevolent God, a good God, why would he require his creation to have to struggle like that? To suffer like that? For us, as Muslims, Though it is basically sufficient for us to fast because God commanded us to fast. At the same time, it is very important for us to understand why God prescribed fasting for us. To understand it. Why? Because if we don't understand it, and we cannot convey that understanding to our children, the next generation, then they may find themselves confronted by people from other backgrounds, etc., who would question them. And because they couldn't find answers for those questions, then you might find them giving up fasting. Believing that we can worship God without having to fast. It's not a necessity. So that is why it is important for our children who we are raising, on one hand, to be able to comprehend, to understand what is behind fasting. And also... On the other hand, for fasting to be real. For fasting to be real, then we need to know what the actual goals of fasting are. This falls under the general heading, which I talk about from time to time, the heading of living Islam, Islam the living faith, Islam the way of life. Every component 
of that way of life has to be lived. Fasting is just one component. A component which has to be a living act of worship. An act of worship which is alive. Not a dead act. An act of ritual, tradition. But one which we partake in. Wherein we understand that those rites and rituals are there for us to achieve a greater goal. A goal which is beyond the rites and the rituals. The rites and the rituals are a means, a vehicle which would take us to the actual goals of fasting. And when we look into the Quranic text speaking about fasting, we see that Allah from the very beginning, after describing the fact that fasting has been prescribed, is obligatory for Muslims. Kutiba alaykum siyamu. That this obligation was not new. It was an obligation placed on all of the prophets and those who followed them before. Kutiba alaykum siyamu kama kutiba ala ladina min qablikum. As it was prescribed for those before, we can still find in the scriptures of the Torah, in spite of the changes which have taken place, it's still recorded there, the prophets fasting. Prophet Moses fasting 40 days. 40 nights. Prophet Jesus fasting 40 days and 40 nights. Neither eating food nor drinking water. It was prescribed before. And actually, even if you look into the Hindu scriptures, you do find a principle, a principle, Sanskrit principle of fasting called Upavasa, or however it's pronounced, I'm saying it according to what's written in transliteration. Maybe it's Upavasa, and Allah knows best. Afterwards, somebody who knows uh, Sanskrit can tell me. Uh, but anyway, the point is that it exists. They are even in Hinduism. And if you look into Buddhism, you look into all of the various religions, you'll find it there. Fasting. So, there is a purpose. Usually, that purpose is focused on atonement. People have committed certain sins, so it is a means of atonement to remove those sins. Or you will find it uh, focused on thanksgiving. However, when we look at the Quranic text, we find that Allah, God, has stated right from the very beginning the most important principle of fasting in simple and clear terms la'allakum tattaqun in order that you would develop consciousness of God that you would develop an awareness in your day to day life in your life beyond that day of fasting or that month of fasting 
you would be more conscious of God. And of course, when you're more conscious of God, then you are going to do more righteous deeds. You're going to be a better person. That goes hand in hand. That is the driving force behind righteousness. True righteousness. Righteousness which is not with a hidden agenda. Because of course you have people who are righteous. But there's no consciousness of God at all. They're doing righteous things because they want to get you trapped. You owe them something. They've done you a favor. Or they will give it to you if you do what they want you to do. So you have that kind of righteousness also. It's externally righteous, but internally there is an agenda. They have certain things that they want to achieve. And in order to win over the people, they will use acts of righteousness. But the real and the true righteousness, what they call altruistic good, good done for its sake, has to be motivated by consciousness of God. Ultimately, that's what's behind it. The consciousness of God. And that is why Allah identifies right from the very beginning the most important principle of fasting. Consciousness of God. And it is through that consciousness as we said, that we become better people. So, we have to ask ourselves. Before the previous Ramadan, and after the previous Ramadan, was there a difference? Are we coming to a new Ramadan the same way that we approached the previous Ramadan? This is the question we have to ask ourselves. Because if we are coming into Ramadan in the same way that we came into the previous Ramadan, then it is not what we are supposed to be doing. The Ramadan that we're doing is not the Ramadan which has been prescribed for us. We're doing another Ramadan. We're doing another kind of fasting. A kind of fasting which is not the one which was prescribed by God. It may be traditional. It may be customary. That this is what people traditionally do. In our country, everybody does this. I do it because everybody else does it. Yes, that may be the case. But to say this was the fast which was prescribed by God, if it doesn't have an impact on us, if we have not improved, if we are not better people, then we have to say our fast is a failure. Instead of fasting, we were feasting. Instead of fasting, we were feasting. We spent most of our time enjoying the wonderful dishes of Ramadan. And this is what Ramadan tends to be noted for. Noted for the dishes. So the women spend most of the time just cooking in Ramadan. You know? And we encourage them because we like those Ramadan meals, Ramadan sweets and things. So we encourage them. But this is not the goal of Ramadan. This is how Ramadan has become corrupted. It has corrupt, been corrupted into that. Like the Christians and Christmas, you know, how Christmas has become commercialized and corrupted. In the same way, 
Ramadan has become commercialized and corrupted. So all the focus is on the foods of Ramadan. We missed the goals of Ramadan. So we end up on Eid 10 kilos more than we were on the first day of Ramadan. We have to spend the next year working off those 10 kilos. Only to come and do the same thing over again. You know, this is what we end up doing. This is a ritual. A ritual cycle. And every time before the beginning of Ramadan, we have the doctor's recommendations in the newspapers. People watch out for overeating because during Ramadan we have so many cases of people who are brought into the hospital you know, with all kinds of disorders as a result of overeating. This is supposed to be the month of fasting and we have so many Muslims in the hospital suffering from overeating. Because the whole purpose, goal, direction, essence, lost. Lost. Why fast? Why not feast? Well, that's, that's what we're saying, really, isn't it? Uh, we'll feast. So, if in fact God consciousness is the goal, as Allah has said, and we are supposed to experience a change, the, the days of Ramadan should be impacting on us. We should be changing our behavior, changing our ways of thinking, where our behavior is not good, our way of thinking is not good, we should be improving, we should be getting better. We should be addressing the problems that we have. So that Ramadan, in fact, will be a month of purification, because Prophet Muhammad had said, you know, whoever fasts the month of Ramadan and doesn't have his or her sins removed, they have thrown away a great good. This was an opportunity which they had, which they did not apply as they should have. A great opportunity thrown away. And there is no guarantee that we will make it to the Ramadan following it. This is the bottom line. We are thinking, well, we still have many more Ramadans to go, but do we? How many people make it to the next Ramadan? How many people make it to this Ramadan? This is reality. We are fooling ourselves. We think we have time. And that's why the Prophet, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, warned us about this issue of time. You think you have time. He said, there are two things about which people are deluded, fooled. Ni'matani maqboonun fihi ma kathiru min nas Two blessings. As-sihhatu well, for all good health and spare time. People are deluded. You think you have time. But we don't have time. Time is with Allah. No one, none of us knows if we will make it to tomorrow. We all assume we will and we work as if we will. But reality is none of us really so it is incumbent on us, it is, it is an obligation on us to look at this fast which is coming up, this month of Ramadan. Look at it as we haven't looked at it before. Look at it from a new perspective. To make Ramadan real. 
to make Ramadan truly alive, bring it alive. Take it from the feasting, ritual, tradition to real fasting. So we can experience for the first time the impact of faith on ourselves. Ramadan is supposed to be a month of rejuvenation. Charging our batteries for the coming year. It should be something like that. That we come out strong. We went in, the year had passed, we reached the lowest point and we rejuvenate and we come back out strong. Stronger than we did the year before and stronger than we were when we went in. So to achieve that, we need to keep in mind this principle of God consciousness on all levels of the fast. And you know, of course, the fast has a variety of levels. Um, we could put them into as much as six different levels. In the end they all come down to realizing the principles of God consciousness in all aspects of the fast. So if we begin with the ritual level of the fast, the ritual is that according to the rules, we don't eat, drink, or have sexual intercourse between dawn and sunset, for those 29 or 30 days. That's the ritual. Now, if we just keep our Ramadan there, again, the night we will feast. We will enjoy. And we will do exactly what it says. We will follow the letter of the law. We have, will have fulfilled the letter of the law. No one can say you didn't fast according to the Sharia. But the goal of the Sharia, the goal of that act of fasting, you didn't catch. Even on that level, that ritual level, if we are conscious that as we go into this fast, following the ritual, we are in fact obeying Allah. So our focus is on obedience to Allah's command. Then that can have an impact on us. That can have a spiritual impact on us. Consciousness of obeying Allah's command. Because that is the essence of the deen. Islam is obedience. That is the essence of Islam. Obeying Allah. It was the essence of Islam from the time of Adam. When he was instructed not to eat from the tree, it was about obeying Allah. And it is the same principle with regards to all of Islam. It is about obeying Allah. Obedience. And that is why worship is called ibadah. It's called ibadah. Ibadah taken from abd. The slave, the servant who has no choice he or she has to obey the master. So that essential principle is there. And everything that we look at, we should look at it from that perspective. On that ritual level, or from that ritual level, we can shift to what may be called 
the physical level of the fast. The physical level of the fast deals with eating in moderation. That's the essence of it. That in this fast, there is a level that we should experience of hunger and thirst. This physical level. We should feel hunger pangs. Pain which hits our stomach. Thirst in our throats. We should experience it. If we're not experiencing it, then we're feasting. Simple. We're feasting. We're not fasting. We're feasting, we're preparing for suhoor. Suhoor is biryani. Huh? Full-fledged. A full meal. Rice, chicken, mutton, you know, we all sit around, we have, knock it off. Ready. So, what happens after that? Then we go to sleep, whatever. Our stomach is still, you know, breaking down the food. All day, Luhur, Asr, still digesting. Maybe about an hour before Maghrib, or half an hour before Maghrib, the digestive process ends and now time to break the fast what fast what fast it's time to feast again and again we sit at the table all the foods are all lined up we're waiting for the adhan you know our mouth is watering and again and then goes and we just dive into it. Two, three times what we ate at Suhoor. So it's no wonder that we gain weight in Ramadan. It's no wonder. Because the principles, the physical principles of moderation in the fast are lost. We're not, we're not controlling ourselves in terms of our eating. Because that physical level, when we experience the pangs of hunger and thirst, is supposed to give us a sense of realization, sympathy and empathy for those people in other parts of the world, or maybe in even our part of the world, who are suffering hunger, suffering thirst, not because they chose to fast, but because they have no food. They have no food, no water to drink. Starving to death, people are dying in different parts of the world as we sit here. Every day. That fast, when done in moderation, is supposed to motivate us. Motivate us to want to help those people. We can understand what it is like to be hungry. It's not quite the same as theirs because it's not going away for them. We know it's going to go away at the end of the day. So it's not quite the same. But there is some kind of commonality we felt that hunger pain but if you never feel the hunger pain then how are you going to be motivated it's going to be missing it's not going to be there or it's going to be weak very weak so when we look at the prophet وسلم, on the physical level of the fast we have to fast as he fasted when he went into suhoor, he was just eating, you know, some olives, olive oil, 
some khubuz, something light. That's it. Okay, you have an egg, slice of bread. Okay, not five eggs. You know, half a loaf of bread. No, no. And then when you break the fast, how did he break the fast? He broke the fast with a few dates, fresh or dried dates, and a glass of water. That's it. He broke the fast that way. Then he went to pray. But we can't make it to the masjid. You know, we have to finish off this whole meal before we even think about going. So they even delay, delay the akama, <laughs> knowing that this is what everybody does. It's a shame. It's a shame. Prophet Muhammad had said, the worst container that a human being can fill is his or her stomach. That's the worst container we can fill. A few morsels of food to keep a person's back straight are sufficient. You just have a few morsels which are enough to keep you from being doubled over, bent over in hunger. See? Whatever keeps your back straight, a few morsels, that's enough, really. However, he went on to say, if your desire overcomes you, then eat a third, drink a third, and leave a third for breathing. That is the prophetic sunnah in eating. The early generation followed it. But the Prophet ﷺ predicted, in Sahih al-Bukhari, he predicted that a time would come in which, as he said, and you will see amongst them obesity. The obese will appear among them. That was something unknown, except for rare cases people had some you know, biological disorders. Rare cases. The average person of that time Obesity did not exist. But today, we know from about seven, eight years back, the UN announced for the first time in the history of humankind, as they know it, the number of obese people exceed the number of people who are starving to death. for the first time. The Prophet ﷺ predicted that that would come 1,400 years ago. You will see amongst them the obese. There would be many. And he was talking about the Muslims. He was talking primarily about the Muslim nation which was supposed to be following his sunnah of moderation in eating, never filling one's stomach. How many people here could say that I have gone through the last week without ever filling my stomach? Put your hand up. See that? Not a single hand. So, have we strayed? The Prophet ﷺ said, the worst container we can fill is our stomachs. But that's what we do every day. We feel that the meal is complete when you're full. Isn't it? You eat until... <clears throat> okay, no more. Okay, stop. I can't take any more. I'm full. That's what we feel. But that is against the way, the prophetic way. And most of the diseases, Prophet Sallallahu had said, most of the diseases come through the stomach. The stomach is the root. 
of the things that we take into our bodies, etc., into our stomachs, etc., from there comes all of the problems. And while on one hand, the physical level of the fast is supposed to benefit us in terms of our sympathy, our concern, our love for our fellow human being, that we would want to help them. At the same time, the medical profession has identified a variety of benefits that come from the physical level of the fast. Among them is a feeling when one fasts properly, of course, is the point, fasting properly, a feeling of well-being that comes from the fast. It is a product of the fact that when we fast, we stimulate the brain, the neurotransmitters in the brain, to create endorphins. The endorphins are what gives you this feeling of well-being after you exercise. You get it there. When you exercise, you finish, and you feel good. That is a product of the endorphins which are produced. Similarly, when you fast, without all the exercise, it produces it also. And of course, they've shown that, you know, it it breaks down, it, it uses up the stored cholesterol. You know, we all know about the problems of cholesterol. We're always checking our cholesterol levels and all these kind of things. So it ultimately minimizes the dangers of heart attacks. So there are major physical benefits that come out of that physical level. However, as I said, what is most important is that consciousness, that God consciousness, that we can achieve on the physical level when we fast eating in moderation. Because that's what's going to stop us from that three-course sahur, right? What's going to stop us from a three-course sahur? It's the consciousness. So if we apply that consciousness, we are aware of Allah, that's going to affect the rest of the fast. And when the time comes to break the fast again, the consciousness stops us from overeating, then it's going to have that further impact. And it's not to say, okay, after you finish praying, then you can go and eat. But again, the point is eating in moderation. And overeating, excess, it breeds excess in other areas of our lives because we, everything is interconnected. So wastage, which tends to come with it, the excess. You know, now we're living in a society where we have huge amounts of waste produced by excess. Fasting in this way, with moderation, should raise our level of consciousness of God, of Allah, and cause us to be aware of this excess and try to avoid it. Try to encourage others to avoid, stay away from the excess. Fasting also has an emotional level and a psychological level. The emotional level where emotions like anger are supposed to be controlled. You're not supposed to get angry while fasting. It's not to say if you become angry, your fast is invalidated. And that's not the case. But you should avoid argumentations and things that are going to get you worked up. The Prophet ﷺ had said that if anybody tries to pick an argument with you, tell them, I'm fasting. That's your way out. Just tell them, excuse me, sorry, I'm fasting. I don't want to get involved in such arguments. 
And that restraint in the time of fasting, of course, once you get out of the fast, we finish Ramadan and we have done that successfully, then obviously that is going to have an impact in how we deal when we're not fasting. It will be much easier for us then when situations arise to say, it's okay, you're right, I accept, no problem. Avoid the argumentation. You know, some people say, well, no, it's good for you, you know, get in a good argument and let off steam and, you know, express yourself. Yeah, shout, scream, yeah. Hey, this is the time that people said this was a good thing. But a few years back, the scientists said, actually, it's not a good thing. Because every time you get to that point where your veins are sticking out in your neck and your head, you're just, ah! when you reach that point, what's happening is that blood vessels are bursting in your brain. That's what's happening. It's not good for you. It's not good, as they say, to get it off your chest. No. It's better for you to eat it. Keep it inside. Say, well, it's going to come out another way. Okay. You control how it comes out another way. Better that than letting it all hang out. It's not good. So argumentation. Also, the... Backbiting, because this is what's happening all around us. Most of our conversations are about backbiting, especially from the female section. You know, we know. It's happening amongst the men too. But the women tend to be noted for it. When they get together, they've got to be talking about somebody. You know, so-and-so. Did you see the way she was dressing? Did you see that? Did you this? Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Backbiting. The men, they tend to talk in an envious way. Oh, do you see so-and-so's new car? Oh, man, I wish I had one like that. You know, it's more that. But this kind of talk, when we're fasting, the Prophet ﷺ said that if we can't give that up, then Allah has no reward for us in our fast. And all we are experiencing from it is just hunger and thirst. There's no real reward in it. Yes, the obligation of fasting has been removed from us, but the reward that we're supposed to get out of it, the life-changing Principles lost. So we have to control. Not just anger, which is like the excess, the extreme, but even the other things which are norm. We're in the habit of doing it. It's common. But it's not good. It's not good. It doesn't make our lives any better. It only makes our lives worse. Because the more you are jealous of other people, what they have, and so on, so you become dissatisfied. Why me? Why do I have this? Why don't I have like that? Why, you know, you're always complaining. You become a complainer. And that stress and comes along with it. Your life becomes miserable, wretched. That's why the Prophet said, don't look at those people above you. Don't look at the people above you. Look at those below you. There are no end of them. No matter how bad you think your situation is, there are no end of people below you in worse situations. Better you look at them. You look at them, you think, ah, alhamdulillah, I'm not in that situation. So, the fast has to develop this kind of character where we're not focused in our conversations on backbiting and jealousy and envy and these kinds of emotions which are negative, destructive emotions. Destructive for our own personalities, destructive for our families, destructive for our communities. 
And the sixth level of fasting, of course, the last level, is that of the spiritual goals of the fast. That was the consciousness that we spoke about of Allah. A consciousness which Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu put in the instruction that whoever doesn't make the intention for fasting before Fajr has no fast. You said that. Some people say, no, you make the intention at the beginning of Ramadan, khalas, that's it. You don't need to make it again. Well, it's an opinion. Some people say that. But what Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, and this hadith is in Sahih, Sunan Abi Dawood, right? This hadith is authentic. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, whoever does not intend to fast before Fajr will have no fast. Every day. Every day. Why? We could have just done it the first day. Why can't we just go with that? Why every day? So that each day of fasting, we are consciously making this decision. So we don't go on automatic, you know. You're on automatic pilot. You just switch it into that gear and then you just flow through Ramadan. No consciousness. It's just everybody. You, it's a routine. You get into it. It's just, you know, you, like non-Muslims say, hey, you're just turning the night into the day. <laughs> That's all you're doing. You're eating all night, fasting all day. Outside of Ramadan, you eat all day, you fast all night. <laughs> What's the difference? That's how they perceive it. Because, unfortunately, that's what we're doing. That's what we actually are doing. So, it is essential for us, if we can keep this principle alive, every day before suhoor, when you're going to take your suhoor, before fajr. Suhoor is before fajr comes in. We make the intention then. There's nothing to be said, no special thing. There's no special dua that we say, making the intention, but it's just reflection. I'm fasting. What am I going to do today? What are the principles of the fast that I'm going to try to work on today? Take each day separately, each day at a time. Have a plan for each day of Ramadan. If we have a plan, then we have a program that we can follow. But if we have no plan, we just hit it like we do every year. You know, as it comes, we just go with the flow. Anyway, anyhow, the end of Ramadan, we say, ah, ah, I did it again. I blew my Ramadan. Maybe next year I'll try again. So, we need to put Ramadan in its proper context. That it is in fact designed to change certain things about us, about ourselves. Things that we build up over the years. Bad habits bad practices, bad words, these bad deeds that we have become habituated to. We are now, it's habitual, we are doing it all the time. But we know it's not right. Ramadan is the chance to stop it, to clear it, to correct it. You know, there's so many people who smoke and probably more people smoke in the Muslim world than anywhere else in the world. Right? 
even though for us it's haram. Right? The rest of the world, they're just looking at the package where it says dangerous to health. They got pictures of black lungs and you know, all kinds of things. Okay, enough, right? Stop it. But for us, we got suckered in. We were just smoking like chimneys. So, people, everybody knows you shouldn't smoke during Ramadan. You never see anybody smoking Ramadan. During the daylight hours. But as soon as the Adhan goes, they break the fast with breaking the fast with haram. So, what's happening? See, the, the, there is enough motivation, there is pressure from society, everything, that they don't smoke for that stretch of time. Outside of Ramadan, if you try to get them to stop for those hours, cat. Ah, no, 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 not cat. cat. Yeah. Chain smokers. Just, one is burning, the next one is being lit up, you know. That's, that's life. But Ramadan, they actually stop. But they don't take advantage of it. They don't really benefit from it. That's the ideal time for the smokers to quit. Because you do it every day. You quit every day for that period of time. You just got to follow through. That's all. When the time comes, don't break your fast with a cigarette. Throw them away. Ramadan, you crush up all your boxes of cigarettes, get rid of them. You know, try to get through Ramadan without a single cigarette. You do that, you bust in it. That's it. That's what they call cold turkey. You give it up one time. No nicotine patch you put on your arm, still feeding you the nicotine. Right? It's not smoking, but it's coming in through your patch, right? No, this is just cold turkey. You just stop it dead. This is the best way. So, we need to Relook at our Ramadan. What are we doing? Are we only fooling ourselves? Because surely we're not fooling Allah. Allah knows, God knows what we're doing. If the fast is not in accordance with what he has prescribed, then we're only fooling ourselves. We are tricking ourselves. We are harming ourselves. That is the bottom line. So we have to decide. We have to decide. Here, tonight, we have to decide that Ramadan coming, we're going to make the proper Ramadan. We're going to fast as we have never fasted before. We're going to make this coming Ramadan real. If Allah blesses us to reach Ramadan, then we're going to give thanks to Allah by fasting as we were supposed to fast. And no doubt, no doubt, it is 110% sure that if we fast as we're supposed to fast, there will be major changes in our lives after Ramadan. Major changes for the good. No doubt. In Tansurullah, Yansurkum. This is the promise of Allah. You do it right, He's going to help. So all the people who have issues, problems, can't find a job. Do it right, and Allah will help you. This is Allah's promise. And of course, after Ramadan, we all know there are six days in Shawwal that we are encouraged to fast. On the basis that the 30 days of Ramadan is equivalent to 300 days. Why? Because one good deed is worth 10, as Allah has said in the Quran. So six more days gives us 60, 10, 360, that's the year. That's why he said, 
Fasting those six days gives us the reward of fasting the whole year. Along with Ramadan. Gives us the reward of fasting the whole year. So we should try our best. Soon as we get past the Eid, knock off those six. Try to keep them the same way we did Ramadan. Don't change the quality. Fast a quality fast. And we have that reward. And outside of the six, the Prophet ﷺ still gave us three days every month. The three days of the full moon. Not because we believe in werewolves. We don't believe in werewolves. right? But because those three days, the Prophet ﷺ has prescribed for us as the best days as a group in the month to fast. We don't know the physical issues that are involved. Well, of course, the pull of the moon on the earth, the tides, there's something happening there. Maybe there's some benefit that comes out of fasting specifically on those days. Allah knows best. But these are the recommended days. Every month, three days. And further, he recommended Mondays and Thursdays every week. Mondays and Thursdays every week. So, if you add it all up, you're getting to almost, it's a, more than a third, between a third and a half of the month, you fast. If you do it like this, thinking Mondays and Thursdays, three days of the full moon, you know, just make that a regular habit. MashaAllah. That's fasting a way of life. That's what the Prophet ﷺ was trying to get us into. A mode where fasting is a way of life. It's not just Ramadan. It is with us all the time because everything that we stand to gain from Ramadan we need it throughout our lives throughout the rest of the year we need it those same principles keeping them intact fasting those extra days will just help to reinforce those principles of eating in moderation controlling our emotions controlling being psychologically sound in how we deal with people, you know, all of the different things, compassion, looking out, helping people, all of these different positive things which come from that consciousness of Allah and our bodies taking part in the consciousness of Allah where the fast touches our hands, our eyes, our ears, our mouths, our feet, everything takes part, part in the fast. Trying to do what is pleasing to Allah. Obeying Allah in all the areas of our lives. So the fast ultimately, the fast ultimately has us give up what is halal. Because this was a question that the non-Muslims raised at the very beginning, we said, right? Why? Give up what is halal. You are just hurting yourselves. The point of giving up what is halal, abstaining from what is halal for that period of time, is to make it easier for us to abstain from what is haram. The pressure, the force, which calls us to the haram is so great that among the only things that can help us overcome its enticement, its magnetism, which draws us, is fasting, abstaining from what is halal. 
It's training. It is much easier to abstain from what is halal than abstaining from what is haram. In Arabic they say that the forbidden is desired. You know, what is forbidden? Somebody says forbidden? Ah, yeah? Really? Now you're interested. When you didn't know, you weren't interested. That's human nature. Like that. So, knowing that that is the factor, then, inshallah, I ask and hope that Allah would help us to reach this Ramadan and take it as we have never taken Ramadan before. Knowing that Ramadan is there for us. For us to make a change in our lives. To turn our situations around. Some people it's a great turn, big change. Other people it's less, it vary. Each and every one of us has something there. It is there for us. Allah has prescribed it because each and every one of us has a need. There's none of us that can say everything is perfect in my life. None of us. We all have imperfections. We're all committing sins. We're all in need of repentance. We're all in need of purification. Ramadan has been prescribed for us. As it was prescribed for those who came before us. So, inshallah, I hope the point is clear. Ramadan needs to be brought alive. As a life principle. Living Islam. Making Islam real. Taking it from tradition, custom, rituals into a life-giving principle. A life-changing principle. This is Ramadan. May Allah accept it from all of us. Bless us to reach it and to have many more Ramadans. But to make this one coming special. Special. So that all the other ones following it can be more special. Inshallah. Barakallah fikum.